I threw a bunch of public betas. Android 9, also known as Android Pi, is finally here, and it packs some of the biggest... I'm sorry, this pie is really good. Can we start over? After a bunch of public betas, Android 9, also known as Android Pie, is finally here, and it packs some of the biggest changes to the core Android experience we've seen in years. Some of them are fantastic, some of them are less so, but just about all of those changes are out in the wild now and coming soon to a device near you, so it's time for us to take a closer look. Before we go any further, you should know that Android Pie is a big update, and I don't think we can talk about absolutely everything here. For that, you should check out our full written review, but seriously, there's a lot. Just check out this list. I'll wait. Of course, some of these changes are a lot more apparent than others, so let's start with the really obvious stuff. So let's talk about what you see when you fire the phone up after installing the update, which is pretty similar, except the trio of Android navigation keys can be dismissed in favor of Google's new gesture navigation scheme. I've got it up and running on this Pixel 2, which I've been using for quite some time, and it does take a little getting used to, especially if you've never used gesture navigation before. A quick swipe up is what it used to take to get into the app launcher, and that's sort of how it works now, but let me show you how this actually works. If you swipe up, it brings you to your app switcher. These are app cards that are running in the background. And what's really interesting is that A, they run horizontally as opposed to vertically like they did in the past. And B, these aren't just images. You can actually take information uh, and move them in between these app cards. So I can actually jump in there and copy some of this data and then plop it into Chrome, for instance. And that actually just works really, really well. If we jump back out, you actually access the app launcher by going up one more, which takes a little getting used to. That's probably the one thing I struggle with the most. I'm used to that really quick action to get into my, all of my apps, and that's basically it. But if you switch to gesture navigation, it does take a little bit more time. Not much, but enough. I should also point out that with this new pill button that appears at the bottom of the screen, you can swipe back and forth between all of your open app cards. You can switch between seven at a time before you hit the end, theoretically but then it just keeps scrolling. And that feels weird to me. I kind of wish Google had cooked up a way for one end to delineate the first app card and the other end to delineate the last app card. So you can actually scroll through all your running app cards without having to sit there at the end and wait. But maybe that's just me. If you're a fan of the dark theme like me, you can actually now force your phone to use it, which is a really welcome flourish. By default, it's not gonna work on this because this is a wallpaper that Google has included with its live case. So let's actually switch that really quickly to something a bit more traditional. There we go. Okay, so by default, it's gonna switch to, I believe, the dark theme. It does take a sec there uh, to switch if you're kind of changing wallpapers, but we jump into settings, we can actually force it to use the light theme if that's your thing. It's not mine, but it seems to work okay. In the past, it sort of worked automatically. It would use whatever colors were in your wallpaper to define whether it used the light or the dark theme. And that always rubbed me the wrong way because damn it, I want the dark theme all the time. So you can force that and it does give you a cooler, darker experience throughout Android, which is finally, finally, finally worth using and available. The quick settings panel basically does what it always did, but with a bit of a facelift. The icons are a bit more spaced out and they sort of shuffle into place as you pull the shade down, which is a nice visual flourish, but it's the quick settings panel. It does what it always did. As we look at the notifications, they look pretty similar as well, but if we peel back the layers a little bit, you'll find an extra level of control that actually is quite helpful. So we'll take something like this New York Times notification. You have the ability to just dig in and say, hey, do I, want these at all? Is this an app that I actually want notifications with? Normally you'd have to dig into settings and take care of that, but a long press or a slide over and a tap of the settings icon allows you to just keep that app from giving you notifications at all. Now I'm doing this manually, but Google will occasionally notice that you're not interacting with certain notifications and just ask, do you want these at all anymore? And once you say no, they just stop coming all together, which is really, really nice. Google has also made Android just easier to use. It makes a little more sense all the way around. For one, the volume key, just as you can see, affects media volume by default. In the past, it was sort of a crapshoot. If you were playing a song, but you were concerned that, I don't know, a notification would roll in and you were in a place where you didn't really want that to happen, you could never really tell what was going to happen once you used the volume key. Now it's a standardized thing. It's just media. That works fine. 
Do Not Disturb has also gotten much, much better to the point where sometimes it's almost a little too good. Uh, basically now what it does is, in addition to keeping all notifications from making sounds, you have the option to prevent any notification from giving you any sort of visual indicator that something is happening. I, for some reason, experienced this accidentally because when I updated, that was on by default, and I missed a good day's worth of emails and Slack messages and phone calls because I didn't realize that Do Not Disturb is on. So it does work very, very well, especially if you're keen on disconnecting or really minimizing the amount of distraction you have in your life, but just be aware when it is running. There is an icon in the notification shade, so I should have known better. Hopefully you learn from my mistake. Now, you don't need me to tell you that Android can look and run a little differently on different devices because phone makers have a lot of latitude over what Android looks like and how it functions. If you are fully into the Google life and you own a Google Pixel or a Pixel 2, you do get a few extra things that other people running Android Pie might not actually get. One of the biggest examples of that is app action. So jump into the launcher and you do see I've got two things here. One is a link to a Spotify uh, artist called Frederhythm. And the other is a suggestion for me to call myself. These are app actions. Basically, Google is trying to figure out at all times what apps you like to use and when and breaks out some of those very specific actions like playing some music or making a call and displaying them directly in the launcher. It's a clear sign that Google is trying to get its AI very tightly woven into the rest of Android. It does seem to work well in general, but it also, fair to say, takes time for Google to figure out what it is you like to do. For instance, there is no need for me to ever call myself especially at 5.30 in the afternoon. So I don't really know why Google's saying this might be a thing I want to do. This is the sort of thing that Google requires time to get better at. So I fully expect this to improve the more I use it. But for now, it's a nice idea that probably stands to benefit from a little more algorithmic fine tuning. Now that's part of what Google promised us at IO this year with respect to its artificial intelligence. The other thing are app slices, which basically allow developers to carve out richer, smaller experiences from their apps and basically let Google pepper them throughout the Android interface altogether. So theoretically, you could be searching for Lyft in your phone settings, and you'd not just get a link to the app, you'd get the ability to hail a ride, which is actually really, really cool. The idea is that apps and the things that we require from them don't need to live inside these little containers. They can be part of the operating system as a whole. We've seen Apple do that to an extent, but when app slices roll out this fall, we will get a better idea of how this actually comes together. And I'm personally really excited for that. There is also just a lot of interesting stuff baked into this that you might not use on a regular basis. If you're on the Pixel, you do have the adaptive display, but it does actually show you more now. For example, you're getting the weather now, which means it's crazy hot in New York, which you wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Now, beyond that, there are a lot of really interesting tidbits in Android Pie that you're probably not going to use on a regular basis. Here's one that I think is super interesting, especially because it gives you a sense of what is possible with devices coming down the road. If we jump into system and advanced and developer options, I can actually force a simulated notch. Notches are obviously a trend this year that are basically unavoidable. Every major smartphone maker has jumped on that bandwagon, and I'm not a huge fan, to be honest. They're not bad, but they certainly ain't great. Just to give you a sense of what is possible and what Android Pie does support, you can simulate some of those. Here's a tall one, which looks hideous. Here's a corner cutout, which looks slightly less bad. And here's a double display cutout for those weird situations where you probably won't have a camera necessarily, but maybe a dual speaker setup on a forthcoming phone. We know companies are working on this. They're definitely prepping these devices for launch fairly soon. And yeah, it's good to see that Google is embracing the possibility here, but man, that's really ugly. No matter what device you use Android Pie on, you will get some baseline performance improvements and tweaks that apply across the board. Some of them are really, really helpful. I actually find them really valuable because Google has taken its expertise in artificial intelligence and sort of adapted it in ways that might not seem super interesting or exciting, but they're very useful on a day-to-day -day basis. One of those features is adaptive battery. The name kind of says it all. The phone looks at what you're doing and when you're doing it to build a sort of profile and manages performance accordingly. I'm using Android P on this phone, obviously, but I was also using the Android P beta, basically since Google I.O. 2018 wrapped up on the same device. While I wouldn't say the difference is night and day, there is a bit of a boost. I can definitely tell that this phone lasts a bit longer than it did before. And we're not talking much, we're talking 
a couple hours, maybe two hours on average. But that's a big gain and it means I don't have to worry about charging this thing quite as frequently, which is a very big get for someone like me. Another cool way Google has baked AI into Android Pie is with adaptive brightness, which does something similar to adaptive battery in that the phone is kind of responding to stimuli around you and learning how best to do that. If you're outside or if you're in a particular situation, basically what the phone is looking for are ambient light levels. And as you tweak the brightness, it sort of learns what you like and under what circumstances you like that. So our office, for instance, it's not the brightest place in the world. So as soon as I get off the elevator, I'm usually pretty quick to bump up my brightness a little bit. Now the phone knows, well, hey, this is the light that I expect. He's gonna wanna do this anyway. Let me just take care of that for him. This is another one of those things that takes a little bit of time for the phone to really get used to, but after a couple days, I've noticed a pretty distinct difference in how it handles these things. There are situations where I would normally have to manually jump in and fiddle with the brightness myself, but it just kind of takes care of itself now. It's very thoughtful in a way that I never really thought I needed until it just appeared on my phone. Obviously, there's a lot more stuff going on under the hood here. A lot of it's meant to tune performance. There are a few things I'll point out. One, you can now actually have up to five simultaneous Bluetooth connections, which is great if you have four other friends who you'd like to share your music with, but don't actually want to share it with them in a sort of old school personal way, because that's not how friendship works anymore. Now there's one thing Google promised us back at its IO developer conference that we don't have in Android Pie yet, and that is digital well-being. If you have a Pixel device like we do here, you can install the beta, but it's obviously not quite done, and it'll be a little while before everyone who has access to Android Pie can start digging into these well-being features. And that's not great, honestly, because there's a lot to get into here. And while it does feel like you're getting overloaded with data sometimes, I would actually prefer that to the alternative. I think having a lot of this stuff just being there for you to dig into if you want to kind of goes a long way, especially if you're really serious about trying to change some of your habits. So if we dig into digital well-being now, it's giving me a quick rundown of where I spend most of my time because we're shooting a review. I've obviously spent a lot of time digging around in the settings, so that takes up the lion's share of my time on the phone. But there are a lot of interesting other things here as well. For one, you can set app timers. I have a Twitter addiction, and on basically every device that has allowed me to, I have set a timer to limit my use to Twitter to about 25 minutes a day. That's on my phone. I will continue to use Twitter at work because dang it, that's part of my job. But you do have the ability to do that pretty easily. Now from here, you can manage those notifications like we discussed before, or enable that really, really thorough do not disturb mode. But what's really interesting to me is this wind down mode. Basically what it does is once you set a start and stop time and you hit that time, your phone screen goes grayscale. So it allows you to continue doing whatever it is you crucially have to do on your phone in the middle of the night, but kind of gives you a reason to not want to do it any longer after that, which is frankly kind of brilliant. I will forever use my phone when I shouldn't be, but if the phone is actively trying to dissuade me by making my screen really hideous, yeah, I think I'd be more likely to put it down. That's been my experience anyway. Hopefully that's yours too. I guess we'll find out because this, as I've said, won't be available for a little while longer yet. Now again, that's obviously not everything happening in Android Pie, and I direct you to our full review for more, but while there are some rough edges I'd wanna see Google sand down in future releases, our prolonged first taste of Android Pie has been a sweet one. That was terrible, I'm sorry. It's true though. Maybe more than anything, what I really appreciate about the Pi release is how Google managed to weave AI into features that seem mundane, but actually work great. This just might be the most thoughtful Android version we've used ever. Throw in a handful of changes that make it easier to do stuff within Android and some crucial system level improvements, and we're left with one of the most valuable, exciting Android releases ever. I just hope you guys get to play with it sometime soon.